Thanks for having me. I'm going to talk today about the North Cascades Wolverine Project. So as, as a district biologist, I'm not, you know, I'm not the principal investigator. I'm not a research biologist. So for this project, I was the field coordinator. And so I'm not going to give you, uh, you know, a statistically analyzed results that are ready, ready to be published in peer-reviewed papers. That's all the job of our, of our principal investigators, Keith Aubrey and Kathy Grayley, out of the Pacific Northwest Research Station in Olympia. And so as a field coordinator, it was my job to hire the crews and supervise the crews that were responsible for building wolverine traps and maintaining them and then processing the wolverines when we captured them. And so what I'm going to give you here, hopefully in the next 45 minutes, is uh, I'll try to turn you all into wolverine lovers. Uh, wolverines are amazing animals. You know, they didn't have them in the Mojave Desert. I didn't know anything about wolverines. But I came up here, came up here and was working in Washington. Um, snow and cold were foreign to me. It was like five months out of the year, it's all snowy. There's nothing to do. Everybody stay in the office. There's got to be something we can do in the wintertime. So we go out on snowmobiles. And this is when rare carnivore detections were just starting to be the thing to do. So we'd be snow tracking and, and these... Uh, uh, motion-triggered cameras were just starting to come out. And so we started looking for lynx, which we knew we had up there in the Methow Valley, and, and what other species we could find. Just for me, it was just something to do, something to get me out of the office in the wintertime. And so we started detecting a wolverine every once in a while on the Methow Valley. And so I became, I developed a relationship over, you know, telephone and the computer with Keith he was kind of the main man for mustelids in the Pacific Northwest. And, you know, Dan was talking about making projects happen. And so I basically lied through my teeth to Keith and promised him that I could capture wolverines and put radio collars on them. <laughs> and so he came up and looked around and we said, all right, let's do it. And um, got lucky and ended up turning this into a 10-year project. And so what I'll show you is uh, I'll follow the typical scientific journal for a little bit. I'll give you an introduction, a brief background about wolverines, a little bit about our methods, and then I'll, I'll use individual wolverines that we captured as um, focal points for what I learned about wolverines. And then we'll wrap up with, um, and so there, you know, it's a little bit of results, but it's not statistically analyzed stuff. It's mostly what I learned as a wolverine trapper and detector in the Methow Valley for 10 years. And so we finished, we did a 10-year project, started in 2006, we ended last year. That was our last year of trapping. Okay, let's see, let me get set up here. So just briefly about wolverines, there's our, their taxonomy. They're mammals in the uh, order with other meat eaters. They're in the family Mustelidae, which includes weasels, martens, and fishers, and skunks. And their Latin name, Gulo Gulo, Gulo is Latin for glutton, so they were named the gluttonous glutton. And so that, <laughs> that came from their reputation that they got from early trappers and that wolverines would go down a, a trap line and eat the animals that had been trapped. So martens, uh, fishers, weasels, other animals that the, the trappers were targeting because they were more abundant. Uh, wolverine would just follow their trap line and, and eat all of their, their, their trapped items. So males are about 30 pounds, females about 20 pounds, so they're not, not really big. And they have a very high affinity to boreal habitats. And this is true worldwide wherever they're found, in Scandinavia, in Mongolia, northern Russia. They're only found in high habitats where there's a lot of snow and there's long winters. They feed primarily on ungulate carrion, so dead uh, elk, deer, mountain goats, reindeer, and then other animals like marmots. And during the summer, they probably get after red squirrels, uh, snowshoe hares, whatever, whatever they can pick up. They have huge home ranges and they're capable of long dispersal. And so you'll see that in some of my maps of our study area. And so one of the really cool things that they've done with wolverines is they've developed this habitat model that's based entirely on snow cover in the month of May. So in areas where you've got a high probability of snow cover into mid-April and mid-May, 
and these are the areas in the western United States, it maps almost exactly with Wolverine distribution. And this is historic Wolverine distribution, not current. So this shows where that when they were down in the Sierra Nevadas, where they're not anymore. So right there in the southern Rockies in Colorado and Utah, and then up into the northern Rockies, and then here in the North Cascades. And if, if you were to show a map of historic Wolverine distribution, it would be this right here. So they're not in the southern Rockies anymore, and they're not in Sierra Nevadas. They're not in the Oregon Cascades. They've been extirpated from all of those. And so then just a little bit about their current status here in the lower 48. So this doesn't include Alaska, a different story up there. But they're protected in all states. In Montana, they were allowed a trapping quota of five to 10 animals up until 2013. So that hasn't been the case for the last three winters. In February of 2013, the Fish and Wildlife Service proposed that they be listed as a threatened species with the primary threat considered to be um, habitat and range loss from a warming climate. And then legal trapping and incidental harvest were considered to be substantial threats. And land management activities, such as what the Forest Service does, timber sales, range grazing allotments, uh, mining, recreation, were not considered to be a threat by the Fish and Wildlife Service at that time. There's some disagreement with that by some, uh, some Wolverine biologists. And then in August, when everybody thought that Fish and Wildlife Service would finalize their listing, they reversed and withdrew their proposal to list Wolverine. So they're not listed right now. And then immediately after, eight environmental organizations challenged the Fish and Wildlife Service, and that is, that is still in process. There was just a hearing, I think last month in Missoula, Montana, that addressed that. And so the final answer on whether or not they'll be listed is still to come. So to our project, I'm based right here in Winthrop in the Methow Valley. This map of Washington is just color coded to show elevations. So the high elevations are red, lower elevations blue. So this was our study area for the most part. We had done some collaborators in Canada for three, maybe four of the 10 years. And so we started out with real basic objectives we weren't even sure that we had a resident wolverine population. A lot of people said, well, those, those wolverines that you're detecting there in, in uh, the Methow Valley, those are just dispersers. They're wandering down from Canada, and then they go back. They don't, they're Canadian wolverines. They don't live in Washington. And so we started out with really um, conservative objectives to see if we could safely and effectively live trap and radio collar wolverines, and then to see if Argos satellite telemetry would work in the rugged topography we have there in the North Cascades. And so we started out using, so basically two methods, live traps and baited camera stations. So I'll talk about live trapping first. <clears throat> Everything we, we do is primarily in the winter. Well, all of our live trapping is done in the winter. And so high elevation areas, a lot of snow, middle of winter, that's the only time you can trap wolverines. We're using bait, large pieces of dead meat. And so in the summertime, those don't last long. They, they attract flies and they attract bears. And so we tried to trap in the summertime. We'd have bears um, breaking up our traps all the time. And so this is the environment we got to work in. <clears throat> a lot of people would say, oh, you get, to, you get paid to ride a snowmobile out in the mountains every day. How lucky. And some days, some days it felt like that, and some days it didn't. <laughs> so it sounds, yeah, I want to be on your Wolverine trapping crew. I want, to, I want to hold a Wolverine. I want to get a picture of me with a Wolverine. I want to learn all about Wolverines. Well, that's about 5% of the job. 95% of the job is yanking on snowmobiles. It's moving snowmobiles and moving snow. <laughs> and repairing, repairing snowmobiles and wrap, unwrapping them from trees, and then moving snow. So our traps, our traps are on the ground. Some are up. This is Hart's Pass at 6,200 feet, and we have to maintain. You know, the wolverines have to be able to access them. So this was, I think, this was 2012, and so that's Adam standing on the ground. He's probably just over six feet tall. So there's probably 13 feet of snow on the ground right there that year. And so it's just shoveling snow. 
<laughs> driving snowmobiles and sh shoveling snow. And so our traps, I just want to show you a little bit about how they work. So um, the, the lid is the door. This is their entry. We have a typically a deer of a, or a leg of a roadkill deer or half of a beaver inside as bait. This is a very important piece right here. That's a satellite transmitter that has a cable, has a magnet right there. Cables attached to the top of the lid. When the trap is triggered and the lid goes down, pulls the magnet off of that transmitter, and that sends uh, text messages to telephones and emails to computers saying the trap has been triggered. And really highly engineered trigger. <laughs> it's a vice grip welded to a big lag bolt on the back of the trap. So the vice grip's holding the cable that holds the lever that's holding the lid up. This cable's attached to the bait inside. When Wolverine pulls on the bait, he releases that lever, lid drops down. We make them as tight as we can so that we don't, we have Martins at almost every one of our traps. If, if we have time, I'll show you some of the non-target species that we caught. But we have Martins living in all of our traps, basically. And so we've got to make these tight enough that Martins can't trip them or we'd be up there every day releasing Martins. And so Wolverine, Wolverines will go in there and they won't want to stay in the trap. They find the bait, they want to take it out. And so they just pull on it and trip the trap. And this is how it works. Wolverine goes in the trap, yanks on the bait, <laughs> door goes down, you can see the magnet swinging. And so now I'm getting... I'm getting a text message on my phone and emails to my home computer, my work computer, saying the easy pass trap is triggered. So then once, a little bit about what we do when we have a wolverine. I mean, first we send the crew out to see if it is a wolverine. Like we do get non-target species, not, not a lot, but some. And so first is figuring out is a wolverine, and then you know, we need to anesthetize them. We've got to, they've got to be uh, knocked out. And so our knockout drug has two doses, a big animal and a little animal, or female, and fem or female and male. So we just look in the trap, try to determine if it's a male or female. We know what dose to use. Here's a little bit about what it's like looking at a wolverine in a trap. So the males, yeah. typically the males are real aggressive in the trap. The females aren't. And so you look in, we determine it's a male. And so we use a jab stick. So that's a uh, syringe on the end of a three foot long piece of fiberglass that you use in electric fencing. And so we use a mixture of ketamine and metatomidine. It puts them out for about 45 minutes. Uh, sometimes this process can take 30 minutes. They don't, they don't hold still. But uh, so once we get them down, like I said, we have 45 minutes, so we want to put a radio collar on. We want to put ear tags in them. We need to make sure the animal's um, doing okay. And so we're constantly checking vital signs. So we're monitoring their heart rate, their respiration rate, and their temperature. And that, that's just to show that that's the needle. I think it's a 16-gauge needle that we use to, on the end of the dart stick. It's got it's to happen all at once. They don't, like I said, they don't hold still. So you use a big gauge needle so you can get all that drug in right away. And so, like I say, we're monitoring their temperature constantly. If they're too cold, we use blankets and hand warmers, uh, put them in their um, armpits and their groin. If they're too hot, we do the same thing with snow. So you can see there's the rectal thermometer. We're constantly monitoring their temperature. So we put in a unique color combination of ear tags. For this one, she's got green and red on one side, red and green on the other side, so that when we get photos of them, we can kind of tell. We also put a pit tag in them. We just inject a pit tag under the skin. And then putting a radio collar on is what takes most of the time. Uh, we weigh them, take diagnostic photos, which I'll talk about later. That throat chest blaze is a unique, unique pattern that you can identify individuals with. And then the collar, a wolverine's neck is only about two centimeters smaller in diameter than its head. 
And so you've got to have the collar tight enough that they don't get it off right away or else you're not going to get any data. And not so tight that it's going to um, you know, affect them physically. And so this is what the radio collars look like. It's just a leather strap that's got a VHF and a satellite transmitter inside of it. And I put this picture up to show that this, this Wolverine, we had collared her in 2007, and then we didn't catch her again until five years later, 2012. And so she still had this leather strap on her neck. The box transmitter had come off, fallen off. And so I just put that up to show that we had had her fitted perfectly. She wasn't able to get it off, but it wasn't causing any skin abrasions or anything like that. <coughs> and then we try to give people uh, the opportunity to get their photo taken. The, this, is, this is like magic. You get to do this once you're a Wolverine lover for life. <laughs> this is my son. The, the one with the hat is my son. Sometimes, sometimes we don't have time for the photos. They're starting to come out. They start, start twitching and growling. And then we put them back in the trap and let them sleep off the drug. So it typically takes about two hours. So we want them inside the trap where they're safe, where they're not going to stumble off a cliff or into a creek. So we hang on to them until they're fully ambulatory. And so while we're waiting, we do what all good carnivore biologists do. We roast meat and we smoke cigars. <laughs> And then we let him go. So even though they're really aggressive in the trap, they don't, they don't come after people. There's probably 10 people standing behind that trap, and he's looking at them. And when they come out of the trap, they go. They just want to get out of there. <laughs> So if you're familiar with the Methow Valley and the North Cascades, so here's the Canadian border. So these dots are the areas where we had traps. There's Winthrop and Twisp, Ross Lake, Lake Chelan, North Cascades National Park over here with this green boundary. And so this big area here is Pasayton Wilderness. And so there's no motorized use. It's not accessible with uh, snowmobiles. So we had this big area that we couldn't access. And so uh, and you'll see with some other maps I show you, we're basically trying to trap on the perimeter of their range. Most of the Wolverine range is this big, remote area where there's no access. And then these are the traps that our, our BC collaborators used for a couple of years. And then here's our results in um, a summary of our results. So the 10 different years we trapped, the number of traps we had, here's the four years that be British Columbia was helping us, the number of wolverine captures we had in each year, and then some of the non-target species that we caught. And so we caught, this, this is wolverine captures, not different wolverines. So in that 10 years, we caught 14 different wolverines, 42 captures, 141 trap nights per capture. And so as you can see, you know, so we're trapping from December through March, sometime into early April. And so for several years, you know, there's not a lot happening. Just two captures, one capture, you know, that's not, that's a lot of digging and snowmobiling for just one Wolverine capture. Other years, other years we had more action. And then these are the 14 we caught. So no, as, as, as scientists, you're taught, we're all taught to be quantitative and objective and to always avoid at all costs anthropomorphism. You don't want to project human qualities onto your, onto your um, data collectors to your subjects. But I also learned at the U of A that wildlife management is a good mix of science and art. And so we decided to pick up the art part and we named all of ours. And so they all have a, they all have a name that was based on whatever was happening at the time that we caught them. And so those were the 14 we trapped. These are three that we were never able to get in a trap. We got photos of them at our trap sites, but we never caught them. And so there's at least 17 different animals in our 10 years that we were trapping. So now I'm going to talk about four or five individuals and what I learned from them. Chewbacca was a big male that we caught in our second year in 2007. We had a couple captures in 2006, our first year, but the satellite telemetry didn't work really well. 
Chewbacca was the first one we caught where the, the telemetry worked, and we could see where he was going. I could go to a website every day and see where he had been for the last couple of days. And we named him Chewbacca because he, he almost got out of the trap. He had, he had chewed a whole, um, another couple of hours he would have been out. And so Chewbacca, I'll show you the map. So this shows his movements. So again, our study area, Ross Lake, Lake Chelan. So this is quite a large area. So this blue line kind of shows his activity area. It's not a home range. It hasn't been statistically analyzed. But that's probably half a million acres, 500,000 acres. You know, that's as big as the entire Pasaten wilderness. It includes a lot of North Cascades National Park. So these are movements that he made in about 10 days. And so we put a radio collar on him. We, he was down here in Twist River when we caught him and started checking on him, and he's just moving all over the place. And this is like the ruggedest country in the country, in the lower 48 anyway, in the middle of winter. Steep, remote, 10, 12 feet of snow on the ground. And he's just, he's going like 10, 12 miles a day crossing major drainages. You know, this is the Thunder River right here. Here's the Stahican River. He's going up and out, and we're thinking, man, how can he possibly be doing this in the winter? You know, it's winter time. It's this stark environment. There's nothing out there. How is he fueling himself? And we caught him again six weeks later, and he had gained two pounds. <laughs> and so my lesson I learned with Chewbacca, he kind of, it was a, a paradigm shift for me in thinking that wolverines are just barely getting by in the winter. It's, it's just the opposite. They are the ultimate alpine survivor. Winter is like their springtime or their summertime. You know, everything else in the winter that's up high, they either migrate or hibernate. And so in the summertime, wolverines have all this competition up there. You know, bears, wolves, cougars, raptors, owls, coyotes, everything's up there trying to, trying to eat pikas and marmots and, <laughs> uh, and all the little rodents. But the wolverine stays up there and he just thrives. They're just built for the winter. You know, they have these huge, they have built-in snowshoes. So a wolverine has a foot that's four and a half to five inches in diameter. That's as big or bigger than a wolf or a cougar, which weigh five times as much as they do. You know, a wolf, cougar, up to 150 pounds. A big male cougar is even bigger. And so just built-in snowshoes for getting around. They have frost-resistant fur. Their fur keeps them thermoneutral up to or down to 40 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then they have this huge, huge dentition, just massive muscles in their jaws. They're just made for chewing, for breaking bone and for um, chewing frozen flesh. So getting ungulate carrion that's down below the snow. And they've been known to sniff uh, dead, you know, um, elk or deer that's covered with 10, 12 feet of snow. And they can use this massive dentition to utilize bone and skin that other carnivores can't. So they're just made, they're made for the winter. And then the following year, Chewbacca, so he drove the point home even further. This is 2008 at the Twist River Trap. This is an entire deer carcass hanging here. It's not supposed to be hanging down that low. It was tied up better. One of the ropes broke. It was supposed to be up where they couldn't get a hold of it. And so it's hanging there. We got this one photo of Chewbacca. It is a big, robust male wolverine. One photo. He looked at it and he walked away. Here's an entire deer, and he doesn't even, he doesn't even need it. <laughs> this is the last, last we saw of Chewbacca. He dispersed, we think he dispersed out of the area south to um, Jesse McCarty's area in the Chelan district. So that's what I learned from Chewbacca. <clears throat> Xena was Chewbacca's mate for a couple of years. We named Xena after the princess warrior. She was the only female. She was aggressive as any male in the trap. And Xena also is the only wolverine we had who woke up after about 20 minutes into her 45-minute anesthesia period. You know, we're, we're here dorking around trying to fit a collar, and all of a sudden she started growling and stood up. And she did that both times that we trapped her in 2007. So we named her the Princess Warrior. So she's, she's one of the two females that we were able to 
uh, locate their den and document reproduction. And so Wolverine's den, as, I, as I'll show you here, they den at high elevations. So this is another part of their ultimate alpine survivor uh, traits. So she denned right here. This is in North Cascades National Park in this um, little grove of trees, which was right here. This is what it was like in the winter. That's, um, this is my buddy Scott Fitkin. He works for the Department of Wildlife. There's a hole in the snow right there. And so she was tunneling down through about 13 feet of snow to go underneath this rock. And so that's typical for female wolverines. They'll tunnel down through the snow to some sort of structure, a subnivian structure, or beneath the snow structure. And so this is what Xena used. So again, the high alpine, they, they give birth in late February, middle of winter, it's when the most snow is on the ground. And they use, they use that snow for thermal cover and to protect their little kits from other predators. And 90, 99, 98% of the natal wolverine dens that have discovered worldwide fall within that bioclimatic envelope that I showed you earlier. So they're all having them up there at the high, high elevations. <clears throat> so this is a video. So we put a camera up on the entrance to her den. This is a video of Xena moving her one kit. And so you can see it there in her mouth. She's only in the video here for about two seconds, so you got to watch. You can see the kit swinging back and forth as she walks away. So that's the first wolverine kit documented in the Pacific Northwest. And then three months, or let's see, so that would have been in April. The following December, we caught this animal. It was a, we could tell by its dentition and its size that it was less than one year old. We did our DNA analysis on this, and it, this turns out to be that kit. So we named, we named this one Dasher. We caught him on December 24th, Christmas Eve. And so this is the little wolverine that Zeno was walking out of her den with. And then Mallory. <clears throat> Mallory was our second um, reproductive documentation. Her den was here in this avalanche chute. So this is on the National Forest. This is an avalanche scar from previous years. She denned right here in this little alcove where a bunch of trees had piled up. This is her coming out of her den. This is what her den looks like in the summertime, just a huge pile. This is me standing on the ground, so it's like seven feet deep with these uh, avalanche debris. And so that, that was her subnivian structure. And then this is really cool. So this is her den site. This wolverine isn't Mallory, so this is her mate, Rocky. And so we're documenting this male wolverine going to a den site. There he's marking a tree, making sure other wolverines come. Because people had thought, you know, the, the theory up to then was that wolverines are totally solitary. They get together to mate, and that's it. The males have nothing to do with raising the family. But having these radio collars on them, here in this study and in another study in Glacier, they've showed that males will actually go to dens and uh, mark them, probably to make sure other males aren't coming. But uh, Rocky was both Mallory and Zena's mate. He was going to both of their dens that same year. And then he also had another part of his home range that wasn't theirs. So Mallory and Zena's home range, he overlapped both of them. And then he had another larger area where he probably had a third mate. So Rocky's the one I want to talk about next. <clears throat> Rocky was my favorite. He was a big male. We caught him in 2006. He was the second wolverine we caught. He had this tear in his upper lip. And so that every photo, he had a little piece of his lip mix, missing. So every photo, he had his left canine showing. Come down. Oh, I come down a little more than that. <laughs> <laughs> so Rock, he would, he would bite the camera. He would bite the jab stick. He would bite the flashlight. He was, he was something else in the trap. Mm -hmm. And then Rocky was the dominant male in our study area from 2006 till 2012, probably. So we caught him, whatever that is, six or seven times at all these different traps. So he had a huge home range, over 500,000 acres. He knew where all of our traps were. He knew where all of our baited camera stations were, which I'll talk about next. We arranged these run, called a run pole camera station where you can get a good photo of a Wolverine's chest blaze. There's a piece of bait hanging up above it. Rocky knew where all of them were. He hit all of them. <clears throat> Yeah. 
and then one more video. And so this was the second time that uh, we had male wolverines. So if you watch this video, there's, there's two wolverines in here. So this is Rocky behind the trap, and this is his son, Dasher. And they're here at the same time. So evidence that uh, young wolverines will hang out with their parents, even their fathers. Their fathers tolerate them until, if they're male, until they're reproductively active. And so this hadn't been documented before. They've since documented in Glacier National Park. That was the last time we saw Rocky. <clears throat> that was in 2013. We ended up catching, you can see Dasher's already got a radio collar on. I think we caught him again there. So what was cool about Rocky was that he would shift his home range. Here's his home range in 2000, 2008 when his main mate was Melanie. And then he shifted in 2012 or whatever that one is, 2010. Had a huge home range. He went up here into Canada. There was a wolverine they trapped in Canada they named Kendall. There's Zena's home range. So he would, he would shift his home range in accordance to where the females were. And then this is a, a conglomeration of all of the radio telemetry points of all of our animals. Uh, this isn't for the whole 10 years. I'm not sure what year this was done. But this is just to illustrate. So the blue is that deep snow layer where deep snow persists into May. So you can see that's where, that's where our wolverines are. Almost every one of them is in the blue, with a few exceptions. This is the Twist River Valley where we had a couple of our traps. So this is Lake Chelan's right here. And then down here is the Inniat River and the Chihuahua River. I'll talk about this wolverine in a couple of minutes. Uh, Logan. Logan was a big male that we caught first in 2013, the year that last year we saw Rocky. His DNA showed that he was Rocky's son but we're pretty sure Logan replaced Rocky. Logan, we got a lot of entertaining videos of Logan, so you need to watch. There's a bait, there's a piece of beaver or deer hanging up here. So when I start the video, you can see the bait swinging in the wind, and then this is Logan's shadow. He's climbing a tree, trying to get to this bait. So he, he did that for, we have, I don't know, several hours worth of videos of him doing that. Then this is him, this is him at another camera station. Oh. <laughs> and same, same camera station, different angle. So that's a deer head hanging there. So that was 2013, we caught him in 2014, we caught him again in February, I think, or no, it was in December. And he just had these major scars. His muzzle was all chewed up, his lips chewed up. He had this huge gash across the top of his head. And he had two fang marks in um, one side of his rump, I don't remember which side. And these are, this distance matches those of the separation of canines on an adult male wolverine. So we're pretty sure he had gotten in a fight with a big wolverine. And it was hard to look at him this way. The art, the art part of wildlife management was, oh man, that poor guy. But then the science part was, well, this will be really cool. We can document, you know, he obviously just got his butt kicked. We can document, we'll put a collar on him. We can document either him dying or him dispersing out of the area. And it turns out he didn't do either one. He stayed right there. He had a huge home range. He basically replaced Rocky's home range. And then we caught him three months later, and he was totally healed, no, no sign of any of his scar. And so we think he became the big male of the study area. And so if you look, the golden, the golden color here, this was Logan, and this was Rocky's old home range. And so we think, we think Logan just booted his dad out and took over. We had two animals disperse. Eowyn was a young female. We caught her down here in the Twist River, so she's the gold color. She immediately, first she went south, went down to Lake Chelan, then she turned around, went all the way across the Satan River into the snowy primitive area just east of Manning Park, and then just kept going north. 
all the way up. This is Kamloops. She got up here to um, Ash, Ashcroft or something like that, then crossed the Fraser River and ended up in the Lillooet Range of Canada. And then a couple years later, Chance was a male. We caught him at the West Fork Trailhead, not too far from the campground where Dan likes to, Dan and Chris like to camp with their biomes class. And he did the same thing, just marched all the way up into Canada, came back down, and ended up settling in this mountain range here as part of Manning Park. And he just stayed there until um, his battery batteries went out. As far as we know, he's still there. So it's interesting that we had animals that moved out. And then Sasha was another disperser. We caught her in 2009 in the Twisp River. And so she's the one that's making up all these dots down here. So we caught her in the Twisp River and she went around Lake Chelan and crossed the Stahican River and came down here in the Eniat River Valley in the Mount Maud area and uh, stayed there until her batteries quit later in 2009. And then this is a photo of her in last winter, 2015, so six years later. And this was taken outside of Holden Village, the um, school down there, one of the classes. Worked with one of our biologists to set this station up and uh, document it. We know this is Sasha from her unique chest plays. So six years later, she's still down there. So just a little bit about the camera stations. You know, like I said, that um, throat chest blaze is unique. You can identify individuals as long as you have a small number. I mean, obviously, if you had thousands of wolverines, you wouldn't be able to keep track of that. But it works when you only have a dozen or two. And then we added this contraption to collect hair so we could get DNA samples from animals as well as their um, chest and throat blaze. And so this is an alligator clip being held open by an alligator clip. And as the animal walks through that, he trips them off and it collects hair. And it's worked fairly well. It's just a lot of, it's a lot of um, stuff to build, especially out in remote areas. <clears throat> but we've used these sites. So this is Ice Lakes. This is down where Sasha was. Jesse worked with Conservation Northwest, Jesse McCarty here from the Chelan Ranger District, to put up this run pole station up on the Mount Maud area. And, um, he had another camera set up. You, you might say, well, geez, he's got the run pole pointed the wrong way. So he had two cameras set up, and one was facing the right way, but an avalanche took it out. And so, but we've got photos of Sasha. We know this is Sasha. And then at least three other different wolverines all coming to this station in Ice Lakes. As part of their citizen science, their citizen wildlife monitoring project, Conservation Northwest, Works also, this is from the Chihuacum or Stephen Pass area. They've been manning these run, or maintaining these run poles for a couple of years. They've documented five different wolverines down there around Stevens Pass. And then Asia Woodrow, a graduate of this fine institute institution, he's working out of the Clay Ellum area in the I-90 corridor. He has a number of these baited camera stations set up on each side of I-90, trying to see if wolverines cross the corridor and then as uh, wildlife crossing structures are built on that highway, if they will. And so Asia's documented three different wolverines using their chest blaze pattern, uh, all, all on the north side. He hasn't documented any on the south side yet. And then a really cool thing from our DNA is that all of our study animals, all 14 of ours, the ones that we've gotten DNA from that Asia trapped or that Asia um, got hairs off of, all animals in Washington so far have had this haplotype. And that's not found anywhere in the western U.S. historically or currently. It's only known from the Rocky Mountains in Alberta. And historically, the specimens from Washington were haplotype A. And so we haven't found any of those haplotypes. We're only getting Cs. So this would indicate, to me anyway, that wolverines were completely extirpated from Washington. And now they're uh, recolonizing with with uh, individuals that came down probably from the Rocky Mountains in Alberta. So I throw this up there. This, this is a little bit dated, but this shows the activity areas of all 14 of the wolverines we caught with a, a few dots thrown in. And then this, so let's see. Yeah, so this is the Ice Lakes area. That's the head of Lake Chelan. So this would be the Stevens Pass area. And then I-90 is down here. And so I throw this up to show, you know, in our study area, <clears throat> I would estimate 
you know, including Jesse's district down here and up into Canada, there's probably room for four big males, with each male having two or three females in there. And so you figure if that, that big of an area can hold 12 or 15 animals, you know, there's not that many more we can fit in the Washington Cascades. And so realistically, the Cascades can probably only hold, you know, 25, 30, 30 wolverines, give or take five. And that's once they can get across I-90. And this, these are records of an individual down on Mount Adams from, I don't know, five or six years ago. And it, it hasn't been detected for a while. Those are all records of the same individual. So just a recap of our objectives. And then these are just my, my ideas of what we learned. So we feel that, yeah, we, we definitely met our two conservative objectives. And then that we documented a viable and a dynamic population that they're not just wanderers from Canada. We have our own population of wolverines. They're reproductive. They have relatively large activity areas compared to other areas where wolverines have been studied. But that's, that's something Keith and Kathy can elaborate on in their scientific papers. We documented immigration and emigration both. We had long-term residents like Rocky, and there were other individuals, ones that we were catching for almost the entire 10 years. And then each year of our study, we had new individuals that we hadn't seen before. We documented two natal dens, documented parental relations, and then the DNA. So for me, that's the highlights of what we did in our study. For our future plans, you know, we're done trapping and radio collaring. We need to figure out a way to monitor them long term, and we need to figure out how, how we can do it in the summertime. It's too many. Uh, well, I'm tired of shoveling snow and fixing snowmobiles. And so we need to figure out how to do this in the summer when areas like the Pasayton Wilderness are more accessible. And so we're working with a couple of different researchers. Uh, wolverines just are not as willing to come to these stations in the summertime as they are in the winter because, for one, we can't bait them. You know, this, this bait is just a, a beef bone. And so this is the only wolverine we've had come to one of these in about three years of testing. And then this is another, another way we're trying. This is, this is a, a grizzly bear survey technique. You got this barbed wire out here to pick up hairs. You have a pile of brush and sticks, and you pour some really smelly stuff in there. And so that's attracting wolverines. So we're trying to modify that in a way that we can collect hair from wolverines. And here's why you can't hang bait. <laughs> bears, bears are really hard on your hardware. <laughs> and then SSD, scat sniffing dogs, is something we just started working with last, last summer. This is the, um, oh, they're called conservation canines. And they're out at the <laughs> University of Washington. And so this is uh, Heath and Pips and Jennifer and Winnie. And so we took these into the back country on different trips, and both of them were able to, so you can train a dog to only hit on or point scats that you train it to. And so we were able to collect wolverine scats with, from both of these dogs in areas where we knew wolverines had been. They were able to go in and find scat for us. And so this might be a technique for people that are willing to walk willing to walk in the wilderness and camp out and take one of these dogs with you, it might be a way to document individual wolverines. And then in addition to being able to be lucky enough to work on a wolverine project for 10 years, I also met my lifelong dream of being in the funny papers. <laughs> so Medhal Valley, Medhal Valley News has a weekly, well, it's a weekly paper, and they put this cartoon in every week, Hearts Pass. And every once in a while, the uh, the author is a friend of mine, Eric Brooks. Every once in a while he does one of these fact versus lore with Fitkin and Roar. And so <laughs> that's me right there. And then the funny thing. Yeah. So if you want to know more about Wolverines, all of our all of our reports and summaries are in the research section of the WolverineFoundation.org. How am I doing for time? So, so I, can, uh, I can take questions, and then I have a few photos of non-target species and videos if you're interested in seeing those. But if you've got questions, right off. Okay. Ready? Here it goes.
like he's limping or anything. Hey, buddy. He's looking at me.